Good evening. You say good evening? We always say buenas noches, which is good night. That doesn't sound good if you say good night in English. It's like, <laughs> see you guys later. Good night. Good evening, right? Yes. It's good to see you tonight. Very good to see you. Today we had, a, we had a great time today. We went to the World One Museum. If you've never gone to the World One Museum, I highly recommend it. And, and not even if you just love history. I love history. I love history because you always see the hand of God working in history as he does things behind the scenes. Um, I enjoyed the World One Museum because uh, it was showing the part, of course, when General Allenby uh, conquered Jerusalem from the Turks. And of course, World War I was the key so the Jewish people could start returning to their land. One thing they didn't put up there in the exhibit is, I don't know that you know this, but there was a scientist named Chaim Weitzman that was in charge of, uh, um, he was a chemist or a scientist, and um, one of the problems they had in England during World War I was a, they didn't have enough acetone, which is a key ingredient in making bombs. And so because they were running out of the raw materials for acetone, Chaim Weitzman came up with a way to synthesize acetone a different way. And so the English government said, what would you, what do you want? He says, a home for my people. And of course, he was Jewish. And as we went through the exhibit, it kind of gave me goosebumps when it had Lord Balfour, when he issued the declaration that the Jewish people could return back to Jerusalem. And so when Allenby conquered Jerusalem, he got off his horse, General Allenby of the English forces, and he wanted to show respect um, towards the nation of well, Jerusalem. But I was telling Brownie that one of the weirdest stories I ever read, we were preaching through the book of 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel in chapter 14, you can read it later, there's a story where they're trying to take a place called Michmash. A good way to remember is think of Mishmash, but it's not Mishmash, but it's, it's Michmash. And it's a key place on the way to Jerusalem. And so it's the story where Saul is a chicken, he doesn't want to go and fight and everything, and Jonathan says, we're going. And Jonathan finds a secret pass to come up on the other side, and he surprises the Philistine garrison, and then he fights him and he wins a great victory. So World War I, and this wasn't in the exhibit, but it just fills in the blanks. As Allenby was conquering and moving towards Jerusalem to boot out the Turks, he was in an area and what they said is that a lot of the lieutenants and majors studied the Bible so they could understand that region a lot better because there's so much in the Bible that talks about the geography. And as they were getting ready to take Mitchmash, the general, I wrote down his name, General Vivian Gilbert said, I remember Mitchmash from the Bible when I was a kid. And so he starts going through the Bible and he finds it. And so he looks at the story and says, wait a second, this says there's a pass. Where's this pass at? We gotta find this pass if we wanna win the victory. So they went looking for the pass that was between two big rocks, and you can read the story later, it's 1 Samuel 14, and they find this pass, and they came up, and the Turks were not ready for them, and they came up and surprised the Turks, and they took it, and so it pays off to know the Bible. And so, anyway, whenever I, whenever I study history, I love two things. I love history as hobby, history and science, because history and science always show God. I mean real science, not this new science where someone makes up imaginary numbers of mathematical formulas and says God doesn't exist. That's just silly stuff, that's not science, but real observational science. I know I drive my wife crazy all the time because no matter what we're doing, I'm always putting it all together and saying, I can see God in this. I, when we go to a movie, I'll say, I think the point of this was to show this, you know, about God or something. The only time I never find God is in chick flicks. <laughs> never. I always say to my wife, I just wish all these people would get saved. You know, they got all these deep problems and everything. And so anyway, I'm getting off on the subject. But I grew up with three daughters. I have one son, I have three daughters. And so, you know, well, you guys have got a bunch of daughters. So you know how it is. When they're in their teenage years, they'll watch a movie at least 27, 50 times. You know, it's the same movie. And it's, you know, if you allow them to watch these chick flicks, it's always the same story. The names are changed to protect the innocent. But anyway, going to... I didn't come here to talk about that tonight. I came to talk about what I believe in my heart is the greatest problem in the world right now. I think it's a crisis. I'm gonna start off by talking about what I think is the greatest physical problem. And I'm not gonna talk about this problem, but the greatest physical problem in the world is starvation. And I'm not gonna come up here to talk about starvation as my purpose, but it's gonna lead into something else. I was looking at the most recent statistics, 24,650 people die every day from starvations or causes related to it. Of course, most of the victims are children. And so every hour, 1,000 people die of starvation. And, and the reason I put that up there is on purpose, because as a human being, 
Whenever you see that, it touches your heart, no, no, no matter who you are. Many times if we see it on TV, we just change the channel because it just breaks your heart that to this day people are starving to death in this world. And of course, as we were going through the World War I exhibit and everything, I listened to something that David said. He goes, you know, it just shows us how rotten man is, you know, mankind is, and these things do too. And, and I thought about that, what a horrible thing physical starvation is. But there's a much bigger problem in the world. If someone was to ask me, Steve, what's the biggest change you've seen in the United States in the 36 years? I don't even hesitate. It's biblical ignorance. You see, a guy like General um, Allenby could conquer and could find that place because there was a knowledge of the Bible. But it's unfortunate now that if we were to fight in those areas, I don't think very many people would even know what the Bible was. Most people say, who cares about Mitchmash? Who cares about all those stories and everything? And it's very sad that spiritual ignorance is what's causing the problems in the world, or spiritual hunger. This is what God says in his word, and his prophecy in the book of Amos. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread. And that's a horrible thing. That's why I put that picture. But this is a worse famine. Nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And I believe we're living in those days. It just blows my mind, and I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to criticize anyone or talk down to anyone. I just want you to hear my heart tonight. This is, this is just my heart that I'm opening to. It's not against anybody, but it blows my mind. It just literally blows my mind how little Bible teaching there is in the United States now. When I became a Christian, I came from an atheist home. Um, I was at church every Wednesday night, every Sunday night and Sunday morning. I had to be there because I just had this hungry for the Bible. I wanted to eat it. I wanted to learn it every day. And now most churches don't do that. And I'm not making a comment on anyone. I realized that if you did it, nobody would show up. I remember I went to a church one time, and um, the pastor told me, you have 22 minutes for your message. I says, my goodness, that's how long my introduction lasts. <laughs> he says, it doesn't matter. He says, you got 22 minutes. And I said, well, why? He says, well, two reasons. Number one, you have to understand that Americans have a short attention span. An average TV program is 30 minutes, and if you take out the commercials, it's 22 minutes. I thought, man, I didn't realize that. You know, I'm learning stuff about the United States. So it's the second reason that Americans are very busy. And this is what I said to him, and I say this in a very loving way. I'm not, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad, but busy doing what? Doing what? If you're not, if you're not involved with being connected to the Lord and the Word of God, what are you really doing? It's a lot of nothing. It's, it's producing nothing. And to me, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that we are fighting the worst crisis of all time. I've always told people that if you want to move somebody's heart, you show pictures like I showed. And if I had a reality show, my, my daughter, my daughter, um, when, when she was still at home, we, we had three kids real close to each other, and then we have the, 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 the little baby. And of course, how many of you are the youngest in your family? You're the youngest one. Every one of you is spoiled. Every one of you is spoiled. <laughs> that, that's what older brothers and sisters always say. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But that's what older, so they always say this little one is spoiled. But I, I always miss her being in the house because she liked to watch these shows on Discovery that are so-called reality shows. And I said to her one time, I said, Michelle, you know those shows aren't real, right? Oh, daddy, you know. And I said, this, this show's not real. I, and so she said, she said, what would you do if you had a reality show? And she, you know, she shouldn't have asked me. And I said, if I had a reality show, it would be real. I would talk about something real. The, the realest thing to me in the world is what's happening every hour. 6,300 people die and 5,000 go to hell every hour. So if I had a reality show, I would ask God for provision, but it'd be real. It wouldn't be these silly shows I have on TV now. It would be real. I'd put a camera on the entrance of hell. Game changer. Total game changer. Everything would change. Everything you're gonna do tonight would change. But I'm talking reality. I'm not talking fantasy. Because many of us are hooked up to, there was a movie many years ago called The Matrix. And The Matrix to me is just social media and the internet. And most people nowadays are hooked up to that and something else thinks for them. And once in a while a person disconnects from it and says, I'm gonna find out what's really going on. And it's revolutionary. And see, that's what really is happening. You know, the, the, the physical death is horrible, but every hour 1,000 people die from hunger. Every hour 5,000 die from spiritual hunger. It's five times as bad. 
During the, during the first hour, we haven't got to the first hour yet, but we're almost to the first hour, 5,000 people went to hell forever. And, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to make something up. I'm not trying to touch your emotions. I'm just, I'm talking reality right now. I'm, I'm getting away from fantasy and just going with reality. That's what's happening in this world. And it's, it's a horrible crisis. And of course, we know what the answer is. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. I want us to see a passage, a weird passage, in 2 Kings chapter 4. A couple of years ago, I preached a series on Elisha. And I love Elisha because I worked with a guy that I believe is the closest equivalent to Elijah, who many of you knew him was Leo Humphrey. He was like my dad. And, and, and um, Leo, Leo was just like Elijah. And when he died, I always thought, I will never be even close to him. Nothing like him at all. And I said, but I want to be like what Elisha said, a double portion of his spirit. And one thing I noticed about Elisha is Elisha was a team player. You notice that he's always walking with the sons of the prophets, the school of the prophets. Remember, he was always doing ministry with them. And it's interesting because Elijah had a ministry that was a lot of um, judgment, bringing down fire. But Elisha almost all the time was doing healing type things, always healing things. And so he encounters a time in history where there's this great famine and I'll just read what it says. 2 Kings 4, verse 38 says, Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land. It means a great famine. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and they sent unto his servant, set on the great pot, and seethed pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild girds in his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried and said, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal, and he cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out for the people that they may eat, and there was no harm in the pot. So the miracles of Elisha are really strange. And when I became a Christian, remember I didn't grow up in church, I didn't know any of the stories, I always wondered, What are these stories in here for? This is just so bizarre. It's so bizarre, a bunch of guys gathering wild gourds, putting them in a pot, there's poison, and you just put in some meal or, or some flour, and it, and it heals it. Why is that even in the Bible? And of course, what revolutionized my life is when someone told me that, you know, the, the, the stories in the Old Testament, there's a historical application, you gotta learn what it really said, but there's also a doctrinal or prophetic application. It's a picture of Jesus. And then of course, there's an application for you. That's the devotional application. It changed my life. And so I think that the reason a lot of these stories that are miracles are strange is because they were signs. Remember that the Jewish people sought signs. And what's the purpose of a sign? To show you something. And so the miracles that Moses did, that Elijah and Elisha did, that Jesus did, they were signs for those people to teach you something. So if we want to understand what's going on here, we pick up on the signs for us. And then, then this thing makes sense for me today, what it's talking about. And so what I want to talk about this evening is what, what do we need to solve this crisis of spiritual famine? The greatest crisis, because I told you this week I'd be talking about crisis a lot, the greatest crisis on the planet Earth is not COVID, the great, nor is it pollution. The greatest crisis is spiritual famine. 5,000 people die an hour from this crisis. Everything else pales with comparison. It's a huge crisis. And unfortunately, the governments of the world will not get together and do something about it. I have a great friend that always says, you know, especially on the mission field, he made a statement that always rang with me. He says, you know, on the mission field, there's a need for wells and water, but governments can do that. On the mission field, there's a big need for medical care and for food, but governments can do that. And, and, and those are great things to do to preach the gospel. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but I'm going to make a point here. And he made this big list. On, on the mission field, there's a great need for schools, but the government can do that. On the mission field, there's a great need for preaching the gospel, and governments will never do it. See, they will never address this problem. We're plan A and B. We're it. And there's spiritual famine going on like crazy in Blue Springs, and it's a crisis. And so what I see here is you need three things in this story if we want to stamp out the spiritual um, famine in the world. Number one, we need spiritual power. If you've ever worked with an organization that uh, does any kind of relief, food relief, feeds the poor, 
or does medical work, you know that one of the biggest problems with groups like um, Doctors Without Borders, uh, the Red Cross, um, the Peace Corps, all those groups that do work to help people is burnout. Number one problem is burnout. And the problem is that the leaders are taught you've got to make sure that your people are eating, you've got to make sure they're taking care of themselves because they will burn out. And I've had so many friends on the mission field that because they did not spend time with the Lord, and I know you could talk about this, and did not get that food and that nourishment, they burned out. They, they burned out on the field. And, and it's so important. So this is really interesting, you know, what happens here when, when you read this. And so to me, there's three things that are really important that come out of this story if, if we want to have spiritual power. I, I think the first thing is figure out why there's a spiritual famine. I mean, this is really interesting. It says in verse 38, Elijah came again to Gilgal. Gilgal's important. Does anybody remember what Gilgal means? The reproach has been rolled away. You remember the story? They're conquering the promised land. They're, in, they're getting ready to fight Jericho. Remember that? They're going to celebrate the Passover. They had had reproach on them when they were out wandering in the wilderness. All reproach means is people make fun of you. Right? They're all making fun of them. You say your God's the great Jehovah, and you guys are losers wandering around in the, in the desert. Once they had crossed the Jordan River, they came to Gilgal, and the reproach had been rolled away. And so they named that place Gilgal. And Gilgal is where Elisha and Elijah had met together before they crossed the Jordan River, and Elijah went back to heaven. So Gilgal is this great spiritual place, but everything's changed. It says now there was a great famine, or Darth, in the land. Now, why was that? Well, what we need to understand in the Old Testament is that the nation of Israel was linked with the land. All blessing was with the land. The dream of a Jewish person was to die in the land and be resurrected. What was the last petition of Joseph? Take my bones where? To the promised land. What did Jacob say before he died in Egypt? Remember what he said to his, his children? Take me back to the promised land. Why? Take me back to that cake because I want to resurrect in the promised land. That nation that the United Nations is negotiating is ridiculous. They're negotiating God's land where he already gave to Israel. It's their land. And so any time they sinned, the land was affected. I was just preaching a message just recently, and there's a phrase that just hits me in the Old Testament, that the land was contaminated. The land was contaminated. I don't know if it says contaminated in English, but that's what it says in Spanish. And you know the way that the land is, is polluted and contaminated? By our sin. You see, the whole green movement is great if we can stamp out pollution, but we'll never stamp it out as long as there's sin. And so in the Old Testament, when the nation of Israel was in sin, everybody suffered and there was famine. And many of you already know this, but this is the cause. It says, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and you shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have, I forgot what the last part of it says. But the point that it's saying there is famine, hunger. The reason there's hunger in Gilgal is because Israel is in disobedience. The reason there's spiritual uh, famine right now in the world is the church is not doing its job. When a believer is not right with the Lord, everybody suffers in the ambient. And so the other people are starving to death because Israel was not right at that moment. So this is interesting. It says in verse 38, And Elijah came again to Gilgal, and there was a dark of the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. Now this really hits me here. There's this huge famine in the land. They need to feed the people, but the first thing they do is worry about themselves. That's the first thing to do. I don't know how many of you have recently been on a plane, but um, recent in the, last, in the last year, I've had to fly a lot of times. And I'll never, I always think about this when the flight attendant comes out and gives the instructions. I remember the very first time I listened to the flight attendant, when they, because usually we don't listen, but I listened to the flight attendant, what they were saying. And the flight attendant says, if there's a sudden decompression in the plane, and it always cracks me up how they have these flowery words. They never say, if the plane's going to crash, they never say that, right? They have these fancy ways of saying, you know, there's a disaster. If there's a sudden decompression on the plane, what in the world does that mean? We're going down, we're going to die. But anyway, if there's a sudden decompression on the plane, these masks are going to come down. 
right? And then they say this, if you're sitting next to a young child, and I remember the first time I heard that, I completed the sentence. If you're sitting next to a young child, make sure you put the mask on the child first. Ah, you're paying attention. That's good. I'm going to tell the flight attendant on the flight on Thursday you're paying attention because they don't think anyone pays attention. You know, they say the first thing you do is you put it over yourself. So I'm a strange person. You guys are learning that. And so I'm on the plane, and the flight attendant goes, well, why do you put it on yourself first? That sounds really selfish. She says, the problem is you'll become disoriented. Why do you feed yourself first before you feed others? Because if you're undernourished, you can't do it. You see, an emaciated church is a disaster. An emaciated church cannot feed the world with the Word of God. And there's no plan B. And so if you don't feed yourself, if you don't find the food yourself and spend time in the Word, then other people will suffer during that. So he says, okay, we got this big famine. First thing you got to do, feed yourself. Sounds selfish, doesn't it? But it's not. Because from that strength, they can save uh, uh, other people. And, and then the last thing, find your own spiritual food. It says, I love this part, it says, um, set on the great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. Verse 39, and one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered there of wild girds his lap full and came and shred them into the pot of pottage for they knew them not. And so a lot of times we live in the generation where if you can't figure something out, what do you do? You watch YouTube, right? You know, I hear this all the time. It's like, I don't know how to fix my fan. I got a YouTube video for you. There's one area that doesn't work with the Word of God. If your eating habits depend on somebody else sharing with you, that's needed. But that's what little babies need. You know, little baby birds, how do they eat? The, the way little baby birds eat is the mom goes and eats and then regurgitates the food for the little babies. So if you're a new believer, I understand. You've got to depend on other people telling you all the time. But there's a point where you've got to get your own food. There's a point where it's your responsibility to know what the Word of God is. You need to spend time in the Word of God knowing what it says in every moment. That's why he sent them out. Everyone knows Psalms 1, 2, and 3, but I'm just going to remind you. But his delight, talking about the, the one who's blessed, is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And I love this last phrase. And whatsoever he doeth shall what? Prosper. Why? Day and night. Day and night. Just like the tree has to eat the nutrients day and night. If we are not connected to God's word all the time, we will have no strength. Let me, t let me say one more thing here. This is so important to me because it has to do with COVID. Before I read this, greatest man in the Bible for going through trials and tribulations is Job. Why? You know that COVID would have been a piece of cake for Job, right? Do we agree with that? Why? Because of this passage. This is incredible. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So, so I read that one time and I thought about this. Steve. I want you this week to do something, Steve. If you don't read the Bible, you can't eat. Right? Because I'm going to be like Job. I want to be a Job guy. Okay. Job says, what's number one every day? What's the priority? Word of God. Are we agreeing with that? That's what comes out of God's mouth. Word of God. Secondary, necessary food. So we're going to have a new diet, the Job diet, this week. Starting tomorrow morning, you cannot eat anything until you read the Word of God. Well, don't do it. Most people will die. They just die, wither on the vine. And here's the problem with not eating the Word of God. If you don't have a good diet and you have a big problem in your life or a crisis, that's where you feel it. You get sick and you get worse. When everything's going fine, it doesn't matter if you have a good diet. It's like the, the parable that, that the little kids learn, right? Two men hear the Word of God. One does it and one doesn't do it. Both of their houses look wonderful when there's no problems right? No problems, no sweat. That's why most Christians who don't spend time on the Word of God say, I made it another week and I'm fine. I made it another month and I'm fine. But COVID comes and you're gone. It's too late. You see, the reason you spend time on the Word of God is so that when the COVIDs of this life, the financial problems come, you lose your job, you're ready. You go right through it with no problem like Job because Job said, when things are going good, I'm going to eat and I'm going to eat good. 
And he made that decision. He made his decision that I'm going to be spiritually powerful by feeding on the word of God because the world is dying of starvation. They're dying of starvation. It blows my mind. I don't even watch the U.S. news anymore. It's just unbelievable to me. It's unbelievable. What everybody's fighting about, what's so important, it's just unbelievable. you, You know, when I lived in the States, I remember I'm a new Christian. I don't know anything. I didn't know Noah was. Nothing, zero. Remember, there was this lady, just just a member of the church, and she gives me a piece of paper, and she goes, do you know about the typology of the Levitical sacrifices? And see, I thought that was normal. And so I thought, man, I better learn this. And and, and so, you know, if I told someone that right now, if I came into an average church and gave a paper, do you know about the typology of the Levitical sacrifices about Jesus? They go, who is this nutcase? But did you know that the rabbis... When they prepared the guys to go through bar mitzvah, you know what the first book they always taught them? Always. Leviticus. They said, you don't know Leviticus, you can't know the Bible. You can't understand the Bible. You can't understand the sacrifices. And so why am I making this point? These are things that we see as there are just extra things on the side, but yet they were produces spiritual power. Power to go through the storms and the worst things that can happen in life. If you read the Bible slowly enough that a listener could hear and understand it, the reading time would be 72 hours. If, if somebody came up here and started reading the Bible, slower than me, of course, and, and they started reading it, it would take 72 hours. You divide that by 365 days, that means that you could read the Bible from cover to cover in one year by just reading it 12 minutes a day. And you say, oh, well, that just sounds ridiculous. It's life. It's life. It's the words of life. It's what keeps you alive. It's what keeps you going. And so Hosea says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So the first thing that's important is power. The second one is prudence. This verse always cracks me up. I'm going to read it one more time. And I want to just see if you see something that's just just ridiculous in this. It says, And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds his lap full and came and shred them into the pot of pottage for they knew them not. Huh? So here's this guy who goes out into the woods and he sees some gourds and he says, I have no idea what this is. I'll just slice it up here in the pot. And what is the equivalent is you're out in the woods and you find some mushrooms and said, Is that poisonous? I don't know. I'll just cut it in and see what happens. And that's the problem that, this is is one thing that my wife told me. When when I first started coming to the States, like for a conference or something, my wife would not come with me because we had the the four little kids. And, you know, I know you guys could relate to that. So she's, she's, she's taking care of the kids. And so she would always give me a list of all the things to get. And, of course, she would send me pictures because I'm kind of dumb. And so, you know, I got these pictures of the right kind of stuff to get. And, and she'd give me the list. And the last thing she'd always tell me, she'd say, don't go to the store if you're hungry. I'd go, what? <laughs> don't go to the store if you're hungry. Well, why? Because you'll, fi- you'll buy useless things. You know, if you're really, really hungry and you go shopping, you go, ah, oh, that kimchi ice cream looks good. Man, I'm going to buy it, you know. And, Broccoli, spinach, that sounds great. Everything just looks wonderful if you're really hungry. Well, when you don't feed on the word of God, you have no discernment, and you listen to any lunatic that's on the TV. I've always asked myself, especially when I became a Christian, especially Christian TV. Now, I come from a lost atheist family that makes fun of this stuff, where there was a guy on TV that would throw a coat at people and they'd faint. And I said, why would people watch this? Because it's like going to the supermarket... You're hungry because you're not feeding on the Word of God, and anybody offers you some food, I'll try it. Sounds good to me. Lima beans. I love lima beans, especially lukewarm ones. And so you would have had to be here Sunday night to understand that. And so the, the point I'm making is, if you don't feed on the Word of God, people will trick you. And people are tricked like crazy. They have no prudence. No prudence whatsoever. And, and so, so that's the second thing that's so important when you're doing that. It, you know, now that I'm a grandparent, it cracks me up to watch kids, you know, little kids. And I remember when they were little. And one of the things that always cracks me up about kids is when they start to crawl. Because when babies start to crawl, everything looks good. 
Is that true? You know, in El Salvador, we have all kinds of bugs. We have tropical climate, so we've got bugs. I don't even know the names of them. Just, just bugs all the time. And my wife is a cleaning, not a freak, but she loves everything clean, and she's just giving up. I mean, there's always ants. There's always cockroaches. There's everything coming through our house. And I can still remember when our kids were little, you know, it always bugged me. They'd be crawling on the floor, and they would see like a dead bug, and they'd go like this. And this is what little kids always do. But they keep eating it. <laughs> and so when my kids were little, I'd throw it away. Now, if one of my grandkids do it, i go, ah, that's okay. That's good protein, man. Just let them eat it, you know, and everything. <laughs> What's wrong with you, you know, to my, to my kids? The reason little babies put junky food in their mouths is because they're babies. And the reason professions Christians listen to junk is because they're babies. And the only way you grow up is by eating. And you got to feed yourself. There's a point where your mom just doesn't give you the milk anymore. And you've got to feed yourself. And you've got to have prudence. You have to have discernment of what you're eating at every moment. And so just like if, you, if we want to solve the spiritual famine, we cannot eat whatever we want. We have to be prudent. In the same way that we should choose healthy food, we should be prudent in the selection of our spiritual food. Now, now notice what prudence means. Prudence means being careful while choosing three things. The source of the food. Where did he go to look for his food? It says in verse 39, and one went out into the field. How many people here know prophetically what the field represents? Always in the Bible, the field. You remember what it represents all the time? Matthew 13, 33, 38. What does it say? The field is the world. I'm not against Facebook. I'm not against TV. I'm not against Netflix. I'm not against any of that stuff. But if that's your steady diet, you're emaciated. You go to the world to feed yourself, and you may be going, cooking along good when there's no crisis. The crisis comes as a disaster. And of course, the rest is the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares of the children of the wicked one. It's important where you find your food. Although you can find some good ideas outside of the Bible, if you feed there all the time, you will eventually become spiritually malnourished. It's so sad to me. You know, it's hard when you're, you're a missionary because sometimes people put you on a pedestal and make you look differently, and you don't want to come along as sounding condemning. I want to come up to you like a grandpa that just is really worried. It's, it's tearing me apart. The absolute ignorance of the Word of God is just tearing me apart. And, and I see people defending ridiculous causes that have nothing to do with the Word of God. We have got to have discernment and, and look for what we're doing. Another thing that's important is the sort of food you put in. He puts in these gourds without even seeing what they are. And it says, so they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out, oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. Thank God there was a man with discernment. Now, now I've read a lot of stuff about, you know, what was that? And they say it was probably a kind of gourd that's poisonous. And they said the way that you die is you start to have diarrhea, and you just die quickly. It's a horrible thing that happens. And so there was a man of God that had discernment of what it was. And that's what we need right now. We need Christians that can discern the times, that know what's going on in every moment. It says in 1 John 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. It burdens me so much when I see a person that's influenced by bad teaching or something like that. And the only solution is us spending time in the Word of God and finding out what it says in every morning. When you become aware of a poisonous teaching, you need to warn others. And I don't have time to read that verse. But thank God that guy said, there's death in the pot. There's death in the pot. We've got to do something. There's death in the pot. People are being force-fed day and night, death in the pot. And they're dying from it. And 5,000 every hour go straight to hell because they don't know the bread of life. They've never met the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a horrible, horrible thing that's happening. Now, what produces discernment? Remember when I first became a Christian, a lot of people would tell me, well, he has the gift of discernment. I always wonder what that was. You ever notice that people that have the gift of discernment always say something bad about everybody? And since, and since there's something bad about everybody, they're always right. You know, I got the gift of discernment, and I, and I just say something about Jose, and you go, wow, he's right. You know, Jose's not perfect. And so what I've learned is that discernment doesn't come from some special gift. It comes from work. 
As a matter of fact, that's what the Bible says. It says, everyone that uses milk, Hebrews 5.13, is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The only way you can protect your family, you can discern what is wrong, what will make you wise, is the word of God. You can see every YouTube video ever made. You can get every title or every degree that's ever been given. But if you're not aligned with the Word of God, you individually, it doesn't depend on your preacher, you individually, you will not have discernment. And others will suffer. And we are suffering. I tell this to the youth workers all the time, all the time. And I, I, and I said it to Josh, not because I know anything about the church, but I said the most important thing we can do as leaders of the, of the young people is to teach them a biblical worldview. This nation is rotting because there's no longer a biblical word of view. That's not the same as a right-wing political wor worldview. They're two different things. One's politics, one's the Bible. A biblical world of view is lined with what the word of God says. And it helps you in every single thing that happens. I mean, you cannot study the United States history and not realize that what made the nation great was a biblical worldview. I don't know if Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin were believers, but they believed the Bible was important. Why do you think it says in the Constitution all men are created equal? You think some left wing group came up with that? It was Christians. All the good stuff in this country came because people believed in the Word of God. All the Constitution is you got a group of guys going to Jamestown. They get blown off track. They end up in, in, in Massachusetts. They make a compact. They say, what are we going to do? We don't have the king running us. And, and, and so over the years they go, I don't know how we're going to govern ourselves, but this guy named Hooker comes up. That's why Connecticut you know, is called the Constitution State. And this Hooker guy is a pastor. And the Hooker guy says, what are we going to do? I know what we'll do. Let's do what Moses did. How did Moses govern? Well, God governed them through the law, right? But how did he govern? Jethro says, you need to pick representatives of each group. And these representatives will form, be democratically elected, and then you'll be able to run the nation of Israel. Well, let's try that here in the United States. And all these principles came from the Word of God. I mean, a bunch of pastors got together and came up with this. And so that biblical worldview in alignment with the Word of God said is what made our nation great. And as we abandon the Word of God as believers, and we don't spend time feeding on the Word of God, other people are dying and they're starving to death. And it just burdens me. It just, it just hurts me so much. The need to go back to a biblical word of view. And, 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 you know, I always do my messages in Spanish. So that word means we need food that heals. That's what solitary means. Food that heals. This is really weird. Look at what verse 41 says. So there's death in the pot. And he says, then bring meal or flour. And he cast into the pot and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat and there was no harm in the pot. Now this encourages me. It doesn't matter what's happened to today, right? It doesn't matter. Because if we apply meal to the pot, it's cleaned, right? And of course I think everybody here knows who is that flower. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. He was that flour that was made into bread. I like what somebody said about Jesus. Jesus is like the flour being cut, beaten, and pulverized so that he would become the bread of life. They tortured him, spit on him, mocked him, and flogged him, but he allowed it so that the wheat was turned into flour by fire. The only one who can neutralize the effects of the poison is Jesus. As he went to the cross, as he was cursed, as he was pulverized, you remember what he said? The only way you can have a resurrection is the grain has to go into the ground and it has to die and it comes up. And so when Jesus went to the cross, he saw this world which was starving to death, which was poison. People are so hungry they'll eat anything. And they were eating it and they're dying and he says, I'm coming to the earth and I will be that flower. And, well, you know, to make flour, it's tough. You got to really beat that uh, grain. And he says, I'll be that. They'll beat me. They'll beat me 30 time, times. They'll spit on me. They'll flog me. But it will convert me into what will heal this world. And Jesus came to be that meal. This is a picture of Jesus. He can take this pot as a disaster. He can change this world if Christians are willing to apply his methods. I always believe we're on the thresh of a great movement of God. Why else would we be here? 
And I think he wants to do something great through us. And the last thing, just to finish up, is spiritual persuasion. Now, you might be thinking, man, it's a disaster. They're just, this world is so messed up. And, and, and I understand it if you're this way, and I have nothing against you. I'm going to retire and wait till the rapture. I see all the signs. You know, you ever thought about this? When Jesus, in Matthew 24, when the disciples said, what will be the sign of your coming? And he said there will be pestilences. Is that the way you say it in English? Pestes in Spanish, pestilences. Do you realize that from the time Jesus said that, there was basically no new pestilences until around 1970? Nothing. Just the old ones, cholera, tuberculosis, um, the bubonic plague, all those old things. And I read an article that was written by the World Health Organization in the 1960s. And the, the article said that we believe now with the invention of antibiotics that within 50 years we will eradicate all diseases. This was written in the 60s by the World Health Organization. They had just got the polio vaccination was being spread out everywhere. They had antibiotics, which was just a radical thing that could destroy bacteria. And they were sure in 50 years we will eradicate diseases. But this carpenter, you know, 2,000 years ago had said, no, in the end days there's going to be a lot of pestilences. And so I read this article by the World Health Organization that was written newer, and it says, do you know that between, in the last 30 years, a new pestilence has appeared, an average of once a year? I always tell people there's only one reason to read the Bible, prophecy. That prophecy is enough. That, I could close the book, it's over. That's it. That's one prophecy. Nobody could predict that. And he says, when you see these pestilences, I mean, think about all these new diseases we've had. SARS, Ebola, Marburg, chikungunya, Zika, West Nile virus, mad cow disease. Does everybody agree with me? Bird flu, swine flu, COVID, AIDS. This didn't exist before. So this guy says, in the future when you see that, and this is going to sound bad, but when COVID, I said, oh, man, he's, he's almost here. This is awesome, man. He's almost here. And you might say, what are you, you're a nutcase or something? But I understand. I understand if you're one of those kind of Christians. I see he's coming any minute, and I'm just going to hang on. I'm not going to do anything. But I'm praying there's going to be a group of people like this last guy that says, although I'm in a big mess, I'm going to spend the rest of my life believing God can use me. Remember what I said the first day? It takes this much faith to believe that you can be saved. It takes this much faith to believe that God can save your mom, your dad, your co-workers, and everyone, and this much faith to believe that God can use you. My prayer this whole conference is that your faith will grow because it doesn't matter how much you know, how good-looking you are, how eloquent you are. If you believe God, you'll change the world, period. That's the kind of people God uses, and that's how this finishes up. This is crazy how it finishes up. It says, And there came a man from Baal, or ba ba Baal, Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, give unto the people that they may eat. Wait a second. Have I heard that before? Give unto the people that they may eat. Who said that to the disciples? Who said that to you tonight? Don't, don't remember anything else tonight. But remember this. Give unto the people that they may eat. Well, why am I going to work tomorrow? Give unto the people that they may eat. That, that's the reason we're here. There's no other reason to be here. It's to give unto the people that they may eat. And, and so it says in this, in this verse, it says, and, and this, his servitor said, what? Should I set this before 100 men? He said, like I would have said, this is impossible. He said again, give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them and they did eat and he left thereof according to the word of the Lord. And so real quick, we got to finish up. To combat the spiritual famine crisis, God needs men and women of faith. He wants us to do exactly what Elijah and Jesus told them to do. Give unto the people that they may eat. Whenever I think about sending out our missionaries, always I think the same thing. We've got to send them out so they can give out to the people they may eat. Because 5,000 of them die every hour and go to hell. We've got to give them to eat. We've got to feed them. They're starving on the streets. They're starving in Blue Springs. They're starving to death. They're going to hell. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. We have got to do something. No, man, it's too big of a problem. It's too big of a problem if your God's a little God. But if you've got a big God, he can do it. And it doesn't matter your circumstances. And I'm just reminding you, remember what Jesus said? They need not depart. 
give you them to eat. Give them to eat. And, and so notice three things about this guy. This guy had everything coming against him. Notice, number one, that the kind of believer that feeds the perishing is the one that shines. This guy came from Baal Shalisha. The word Shalisha means multiplies three times. Does anybody know who Baal is? You guys know who he is. That's the devil. That was the, that was the God that the pagans worshipped. And so who solves the spiritual crisis? Somebody who's working in a place where everybody's lost. Somebody who lives in a family where everybody's lost. Someone who lives in a city where everybody doesn't want to hear about Jesus. That's who God uses. And he shines. He's a shining light among all those people. That's who saved the day. There came a man from Baal Shalisha. But, but that's not the most important thing. And I put it up there. Baal Shalisha means Baal multiplies. When you live or work in a place of darkness, God can use you if you're willing to shine. But, but number two, one that sacrifices. And I, and I always told people, you know, in our church, we have a discipleship program that we hope goes from salvation to being a leader in our church. And we always base it on the three times Jesus called the disciples. He called them three times and said, follow me. The first time he said, follow me, and nothing else happened. He just said, follow me and watch. And we call that phase servant, a uh, uh, follower, follower. In Spanish, it's seguidor. And so follower. In the first part of the ministry, Jesus just said to him, follow me. What did, what did the disciples do when he turned the water into wine? Nothing. Because the first part of his discipleship was what you know. You've got to learn. So they would follow him around and they would learn. They would observe what he was doing. And he was trying to prove two things. Okay? Number one, I'm the son of man. I'm the Messiah. So he did all the miracles that Moses did. He didn't turn water into blood. He turned it into wine. But he did all the miracles that Moses did. And that he's the son of God which means he's God. That's why he stilled the winds. That's why he did miracles. That's why he did all these incredible stuff. Once they were convinced this is God in the miracle catch, he quit doing miracles, basically. Phase two, he says, now follow me and I will make you to be fishers of men. Now they're servants. The second part of the ministry, if you take the chronology of his gospels, they were to be servants. It wasn't so important what they knew. It was important what they did. So when he turned water into wine, what did the disciples do? Nothing. When they fed the 5,000, did they do something? Yeah, it's the second phase. It's being a servant. It's what you do. Third phase, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Sacrifice. And sacrifice has to do with character. In the last part of the ministry, he exposed the disciples to other people all the time because they had to sacrifice their ego. And I've always told people, if there's one teaching that's countercultural in the United States, it's sacrifice. Here, it's, when I used to live in the United States, it was believe in God, love God, and get forgiveness from God. Now the three pillars of Americans is believe in yourself, love yourself, and forgive yourself. And sacrifice is a dirty word. And that's the problem. Jesus was looking for people that wanted to be living sacrifices. And what does this man do? He's starving to death. What did he do? He brings his free first fruits. He brings his bread. He says, I'm going to bring you the best that I have. I'm just going to read this because of time. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. This just blows my mind. This guy's starving to death. And he brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and fullers of corn in the husk they rib. And he said, give it to the people they may eat. Can you imagine that sacrifice living in a pagan land? And you bring it? You might say, well, why did he bring it to Elijah? Because the priesthood was a disaster at that time. He had to get, bring it to a prophet. And that's all he had. And so it's someone who sacrifices. And giving your first fruits in a time of famine is a great sacrifice. But they come from God and he promises that he will provide for us. The first fruits do. When we do not give our money and time to the Lord is because we have little faith. Try God on your faith will increase as you see God's work in your life. That's what God's looking for. People that say, I believe you so much that I know if I sacrifice this little, you'll multiply. And finally, it's someone that submits. What did he say? Oh, it can't be done. Oh, the problem's too big. Oh, the Democrats are ruining the country. Ah, oh, there's all these lost people. Ah, oh, we can't do it. He said, okay, because his God's so big. His God's big. 
His God can overcome all this kind of stuff. You know, I always tell people, I understand what it was like for Moses. He had to take three million Americans around the desert because nobody whines like Americans. No, I'm serious. It's unbelievable. You don't hear whining like this in El Salvador. Americans are such whiners. Oh, you poor guys, you're so poor. Richest country on the planet. Oh, it's so horrible. It's just so hard. Can't do it. And God says, sacrifice a little and believe that I can do it. And he changed the world. We can't solve the spiritual famine, but God can. He can multiply our few loaves to feed the whole world. And I know you guys love the Word of God a lot, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, although I guess you wouldn't say that anymore because there's no choirs. You're, I'm preaching to the, the praise team. Awesome praise team, by the way. I want to say that again. But I'm preaching to the praise team here. Note the parallels. This is a good way to end up, end up the message. Note the parallels between the feeding of the 5,000 and this story. And I want you to note the parallels. Number one, there was a crowd of hungry people, both cases. Do we agree with that? Okay. Number two, Elisha and Christ had compassion because they were hungry. Number three, a few barley loaves formed the main diet of the people. Number four, the order was feed the people. Number five, an incredulous assistant raised objections. Remember in both cases? We, we can't do it. Number six, the multitude was fed through the servants. You see, Jesus sees people are hungry, but he's not going to feed them. He needs you, okay? He needs you to do it. And seven, there was leftover food. However, Jesus is superior. Jesus fed 5,000, Elisha only 100. Jesus used only five loaves, Elisha 20. Jesus provided a richer feast because he gave fish too, and Jesus did it in his own power. Jesus lives in you, not Elisha. You said that we're the hands and feet of Jesus. And somebody said before we started the service that he likes to hug other Christians because he's hugging Jesus. See, Jesus, his heart's broken because people are starving to death. Just like when I started the whole presentation, I showed the starving children that broke your heart because you're a human being. That's how Jesus sees the people you work with that don't know the Lord. The people you live with who don't know the Lord. The multitudes in blue springs in the rest of the world that don't know the Lord. And you know what Jesus says? Feed the people. I'm just going to add another word. Please feed the people. Please have an ounce of compassion for the people. They're starving. And the only way I can feed the people is I need power. I've got to feed myself first. I need prudence. I need discernment. And the discernment comes from, re from eating the Word of God. But I need to believe. And my challenge to you, you don't have to answer the question, is how big is your God? Is He big enough to overcome your shortcomings to change the world? And my prayer is that your faith will grow. God breaks, His heart breaks for the starving, and He wants to use us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, and thank you for how clear it is. And Lord, I pray for those that live with us, work with us, and study with us that are starving to death. Oh, it's so horrible. And one day, if they're not fed, they'll go to an eternal hell. Oh, it's a horrible thought. Lord, help us to plug into reality. Help us to disconnect from the internet matrix and connect to the Word of God so we can see real stuff. Help us to disconnect from fantasy and connect to reality and see the world through your eyes and help us to have our hearts break for those that don't know you, Lord. I thank you so much for this church, for First Bible Baptist Blue Springs that preaches your Word. I thank you so much for the people that are here that I know are studying the Word and I know are discipling and I know that the group that here wants to see people saved and discipled. But Lord, I pray that our faith would grow. We get discouraged. We see that 30% haven't come back to church. Sometimes it looks like the, like the devil is winning, Lord. But I pray tonight that our faith would grow. And Lord, that you would use us to feed this world, Lord. Help us to be obedient to feed the world so they can know you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. And if there's anybody here this morning.